These regulations, if passed, will compel Northern Ireland health ministers to commission abortion services in line with the legal framework outlined, outlined in the 2020 regulations. Mr Chairman, abortion is a devolved issue and the only legal or moral basis for intervention by the UK Government in this area in 2019 was that there was no sitting Northern Ireland Assembly at that time. As we're all aware, that's no longer the case. And the Assembly has shown itself to be perfectly competent to develop its own legislation. I believe, therefore, that there's no longer any justification for the UK Government to enforce these regulations. Pressing ahead with them, as we are doing today, is a breach of the Belfast Agreement and I believe weakens the trust and respect upon which devolution is founded. It's not only the fact of the legislation that threatens the devolution agreement, the nature of the regulations shows disregard for the democratic will of the Northern Irish people. In 2020, every MP representing Northern Ireland who took their seat in Westminster voted against the regulations. The Northern Ireland Assembly opposes the regulations. When the people of Northern Ireland were consulted on the regulations last year, 80% reje rejected them. As an English Conservative MP, I will have a free vote on this legislation. The people of Northern Ireland and their representatives have no vote at all. Mr Chairman, not so very long ago, members of this government campaigned passionately to take back control. The British people have rejected the rule of a remote Brussels, preferring to make our own laws according to our own British values and customs. In 2005, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the UK's blanket ban on prisoner voting contravened international law and must be rectified. Parliament refused, upholding our UK belief, enshrined in statute since 1870, that those who don't abide by the law of the land don't have the right to vote. Parliament never conceded, and we left the EU 15 years later with our sovereignty intact. Prisoner voting is not as an emotive issue as abortion, but it is a conscience issue all the same. How can the UK government, with integrity and without hypocrisy, impose legislation against the democratic will and values of the communities of Northern Ireland when it has spent so long resisting similar attacks by our own sovereignty? Yes, I'll give way. I'm slightly confused by um, what you're saying. In that the, um, the Minister in Northern Ireland has um, said that the law is the law and that he has put forward to the Northern Ireland Executive provisions to enact the law but they have refused to do so. So I'm not entirely sure what she means when she refers to the fact that they are, uh, you know, that they have been doing so, because they've actually not, which is why we are here today. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for intervention, and I, I will come back to that. I, I understand that, as the regulations as they stand um, are the law, but my, I will urge the government later on in my um, contribution to repeal Section 9, which I believe is the right moral thing to do now, but I thank the Honourable Lady for intervention. Can I make some progress and then I'll give way? It would be one thing for this legislation uh, to bring Northern Ireland's abortion framework into line with that of Great Britain, um, but these measures go beyond Great Britain, British equivalents and mandate an abortion regime that is quite unrestricted and I believe is unsafe. Unlike in England and Wales, there will be no requirement for two doctors to certify and abortion will be available routinely at GP surgeries rather than in restricted places only. And the regulations, although I, I appreciate the government's uh, requirement for safeguards could permit sex selective abortion by default since they do allow abortion for any reason until 12 weeks gestation. I wonder if my honourable Yes, I will give way. I mean, what my honourable friend is saying, Mr Chairman, is frankly shocking because what she's saying is that far from the claim that we're bringing Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland's laws on abortion are going to be entirely different from those that pertain the rest of the United Kingdom, considerably more permissive, and therefore further out of line with local opinion there, even than the laws that prevail in England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, I thank my right honourable friend for his intervention, and as has already been said by honourable members, I appreciate this is a very emotive issue, and many of us have very different opinions, and I fully accept the opinions of uh, other honourable members, but I would like to make progress with the particular point of view that, that I am bringing uh, to this issue. Um, and so not only could these regulations or the enforcement of the regulations permit sex-selective abortion, they also allow abortion up to birth for babies with disabilities, even those disabilities which do not prevent people from living fulfilling lives. And I'm particularly concerned that without necessary safeguards, women in abusive relationships may be coerced 
into abortion. So these regulations and the enforcement of them do introduce new possibilities for sex and disability discrimination and go far beyond what is legally necessary or even safe. Now I'm going to make some focus. But the government overreach in this legislation goes beyond abortion regulations. Paragraph 85 and 86 of the CEDAW Committee report that were made by statute, that were made statute by the passage of Section 9 cover matters that extended to health, education and the role of women. One provision in paragraph 86 calls on the government to adopt a strategy to combat gender-based stereotypes regarding women's primary role as mothers. Now, as a woman and a, a mother, I find that statement rather patronising. Is it the government's job to tell me how I should value my identity as a mother? Rather than celebrating and promoting the vital role of women in nurturing the next generation, this statement speaks of motherhood in negative terms, and it reinforces a different stereotype, one that views motherhood as second best. I have a degree from Cambridge University, I'm a fully qualified science teacher, I became the first Conservative MP to be elected in Sheffield in nearly 30 years. But above all these achievements, far beyond these achievements, the role I value most, my greatest achievement, is mother to my three children. There are hundreds of Conservative MPs, tens of thousands of science teachers, but my children have only one mum and no one can replace me. Their lives, their well-being and their future depend to a large part on how well I do my job.